Hurling on Off The Ball With Bored Gosh Energy Hurling, it's anyone's game It's All-Ireland Final Hurling Week and we are looking ahead to Limerick against Kilkenny in the company of All-Ireland winners both James O'Connor, hello Joe, how are things? Great, and David Herity with us as well David, how you doing? Joe, oh, great, how are you keeping us? Very well doing, Jamesy, I have you as what? Obviously 95 and 97. David, where are you? Five, is it? Just a five? Wikipedia tells me. Oh, I was, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a few asterisks on a few of those, all right. I was sub as well, so I'm not. I'm never, never going to claim that I'm in the same bracket of Jamesy when it comes to that, all right. Okay, just the five. So you're like a poor relation walk around Kilkenny with five. That's, yeah. Do you know what? It, it's, it's still, yeah, it's still kind of flabbergasting when you're going to see that some of the lads are still on four. Like not not that they, they were cruising for a long time there and they were racking them up and uh, yeah. it is kind of hard to believe it's eight years since Kenny won one. It's just uh, because it, I remember even at a time he used to be travelling home with Rich, Richie Hogan and he'd say that he he break the ten no bother like um, that's the way things were going with Kenny that he was he was on six or seven at the time and that he'd, he'd eventually break the ten but it just it obviously never happened. The breaks came on. Well, I'm sure he'll, he'll love you making that public, but um, how and ever. <laughs> <laughs> he's not looking at he's not looking at media. It's it's all Ireland week, so no one looks at it. Uh, do you really not look at it? Do you switch off during All Ireland final week? Jamesy, is a very different week for you, ninety five, ninety seven, were you totally um ensconced away? Yeah, it's a it's a long time ago now, Joe. <laughs> for me. That's true. For me. Yeah, sure. But you tried to you tried to um, you know, stay out of town and, and keep things as <clears throat> as normal and as low key as possible. I mean the last thing you want to be doing is is burning energy talking to people about it and it's it's inevitable that every every person you bump into yeah. wants to talk about nothing other than the other than the game. But um I think look at both sides of plenty of experience, you know, in terms of you know what lies ahead on Sunday so I think uh, there'd be no problems with either of them in that regard No I wouldn't think so It's interesting though David Kilkenny have lost three All-Ireland finals since their last win 16, 19, 22 we had Sean O'Gahalpin just in and you know he was jokingly saying there are four certainties in life one of them being Kilkenny in finals but that's three in a row now which you wouldn't kind of associate with Kilkenny this is their longest gap between All-Ireland wins since 83 to 92 does it like feel like a famine in the county does it feel do you suspect similar to 83, 92 Jeez, I was only born in eighty three and ninety two. I, I wouldn't have had a I haven't I haven't a clue of Kilkenny's history really to be honest. We're kind of uh, my family are blowings. Uh into in I'm the only one that was born actually in the parish, um and in Kilkenny. My brother was actually born as well, but uh, over the road. Uh it, it does it feel like family it does, yeah, at minor level as well, at under twenty level until Derek obviously broke that last year. It, it's you know, the big thing that was always gonna say that Brian brought Kilkenny out of the famine and then I suppose kind of led them into another one it's um, uh, you know I don't mean that in any disrespect but it was just it was it got to a stage where you just expected to be winning and winning and winning and it it, it didn't happen I'd say we Kilkenny possibly took the eye off the ball when you're winning as much as you are at underage um, you just figure look at anyone will do like you know we'll just we'll have our standards set at a, at, a, at a certain level we don't really need to put in the the same effort maybe at underage um and i, I do think uh, in those vital years there in the end of the noughties um and the start of obviously the tens possibly didn't look and try and reinvest enough into the underage structure and kenny I'd, I'd be very strong on that and um, while other counties were getting their act together Kilkenny kind of hope that tradition would get them through and sometimes when you're looking at the likes of Kieran's winning colleges all Ireland uh, which they do and do quite frequently you kind of just automatically just think ah, that'll be grand Kilkenny will just keep coming but it hasn't um, they're starting to get their act together now they've uh, obviously Michael Finley in has taken on that kind of performance role in Kilkenny but I still think it'll be a fair few years before we really see um, the, the fruits of that you know you look at Limerick they've really hit the ground run a long time ago Cork are mopping up all Ireland's tip are on 20 level as well. You see the work that's been done there with certain teams there. Even I know um, Wexford have a, a full time development officer as well. Now Williams has gone in there as well. Um, Dublin again. So I, I just think it's um, we've missed the boat a small bit. We're trying to play catch up, but it'll probably be a few years yet before we really see the, the fruits of that work. Yeah, interesting. So I guess it's a 
repeat, obviously, of last year. Jamesy, how are both feeling? I mean, there's been so much talk with Dublin and Kerry and, and the way they won their semi-finals and how that sets them up for the final. And, and there's kind of a general sense of perfect preparation for the final for both of them. They came through, got a bit of a scare, uh, weren't too perfect. What would you say about Limerick and Kilkenny and how they came through their semi-finals? Uh, well, I just want to go back to your heresy. Corey leads Kilkenny to famine. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> that headline out there. No, um, uh, like listen, but, but sorry, you know, he, d- he didn't mean it in a disrespectful way. I, I, <laughs> no, no. Didn't, so I no absolutely Once you say that after what you said, it's actually grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose look at Joe. I, I left Croke Park on Saturday evening, um, thinking that, irrespective of who came through the second semi final, that we 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 probably seen the All Ireland champions. Given that you know Limerick delivered this was their, their most emphatic performance of the year in many respects against Galway, um, laid waste to the Galway challenge once they once they got to grips with it. So um, from their perspective, look at they're in a great place. Their energy levels look to be back up, um, you know, to where they were. You know, specifically in, in, in their pomp last year, the year before. Um, and from a Kilkenny perspective, I mean, obviously, there was always going to be a sterner challenge coming from Clare. And look at Kilkenny, were, they were brave, they were really efficient. You know, Mossy Keown their first wide thing in the 28 minutes. And when the game was there to be won at the end, Joe, you know, they, they showed all the same composure, a bit of clear headedness that you need to get over, the, get over the line. So, in many respects, you know, perfect way for Kilkenny, you know, really strong stiff test and clear uh, a lot of questions asked and, and, and came through it so look, I, I think they're in a really good place and the closer it gets to the to, to Sunday um, you know the more the more I'm thinking this is this is not going to be straightforward for Limerick because you know you didn't take you know last year as a as a you know reference point you know there's no Sean Finn who really put the shackles on Owen Cody last year Cody is playing like a man possessed um, you know so that's that's a guy that you know Limerick obviously have to account for there's no Declan Hannon or it appears there's going to be no Declan Hannon um, oh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd have heard the opposite you reckon he's out do you? yeah I don't know I mean diff- different things um, you know ir- irrespective let, let's assume he doesn't play okay. uh, you know I mean look at Willow Dunhu's transition to cent- centre back I mean it was seamless but it still means that you've got to shuffle the deck and you've one less card to play you know play elsewhere um, and I suppose you know maybe more tellingly like the Lyric half hour run last year, you know, Hagerty was unbelievable. Obviously, won five from play, man of the match, um, nigh on unmarkable. You know, he is no form, um, you know, compared to compared to twelve months ago. And like, look at he he's he's a big game player and he's really delivered his best performance of the year in, in, in the All Ireland final. But it's a stretch to think that, you know, he's gonna pick up where he left off last year, given, you know, the way he's he struggled maybe to even get anything close to the number of shots off that he did um, at goal compared to compared to twelve months ago. Um, you know, Hugh Lawler matches up really well with Galan and the way Limerick are playing, you know, the half forward line, if Anthony are coming deeper and it's maybe placing more of a you know, our alliance on Galan and maybe Flanagan up front to, to to do the business on the score in front. So, you know, I, I think that Limerick like will have to play really well. And and Joe, don't forget either, I mean this look at this the disappointment of last year from a Kilkenny perspective but there's also the height they got in the league final I mean it was 220 to, to 15 points and Limerick shot 20 wides in 15 in the second half mm. um, and you can be sure that, that was referenced the way Limerick maybe laid it on you know in the second half in the in, in Nolan Park this week so like <clears throat> hunger is the best sauce and this is a Kilkenny side that are ravenously hungry and a lot of those Kilkenny players you know Tommy Walsh Hugh Lawler you know Blanchfield those guys don't have an Ireland medals um, and you know, they're coming to Croke Park to really bring it on Sunday. So, yeah, I, I don't see this being straightforward um, or anything like as straightforward as I, as I might have thought maybe two weeks ago. Yes, I know David Clare will have their regrets maybe about how they set up in the first half against Kilkenny the last day and they made a real game of it in the second half. That said, there, were, there was so much to be impressed about by Kilkenny. Like, I think of that Conor Fogarty block and the work rate and, you know... it like nine times out of ten he might have been called upon there but he made the run just in case he was and it counted and there, there, like, there was that great intensity about Kilkenny's play I, I, I suspect if nothing else that intensity is going to make life very difficult for Limerick it is yeah um, well that's that's exactly it that's I was looking up at the, the puck outs there the last uh, I look back for the last few days and obviously this interview was coming up or this chat and uh Looking at the last three games. This isn't an interview. It's not all about you, right? (laughs) (laughs) The last last three games there. And uh, 
even when even when Limerick aren't dominating puckouts like they did against Clare in the Munster final, they scored one eleven off their own puckouts. People are Joe or, or Nicky Quaid's puckouts are absolutely exceptional. The way he's able to find the man on the run, play the ball just to the outside, and I can actually see why. You know, Clare for, or Galway frustrated Limerick then the last day by putting obviously Mannion back and Concanon back and, and clogging up the, the two channels like Kilkenny didn't do last year's final. Like James said there, they got 114 or 15 from the from the half forward line. But Nicky Quaid's puckouts are absolutely vital to what's actually going to happen and making them take. And the reason why Galway uh, got so were were so far ahead and six points ahead in the first half is the fact that when they went short when they came back and clogged up those channels and Limerick then had to go short they only won five out of the 14 when I mean five they, they only retained five when they actually poked them into the far the far opposition half and that obviously put them under fierce pressure mm. the problem for Galway is the fact that in the second half they couldn't actually win a ball to hit it over the bar to actually hit it wide for them to get able to counteract um counteract this but the, the big thing for Kilkenny and Limerick is even when they don't win long puckouts and Kilkenny are still kind of very reliable on going long and trying to hit John Donnelly or hit TJ or hit maybe Wally Welsh if he does manage to when he does manage to come on um, is the fact that even when they lose the ball their physicality and their actual their ability to be able to turn over the ball is exceptional yeah. and when you look back on this like even, even the last day Kilkenny got cleaned over they only won half the balls they went long they went long with it there Jesus first the first half I had they lost 10 out of 18 then again the second half was very poor it was 8 out of 16 when they went long but it's the fact that if you look at uh, even the Leinster final there they lost the puck out they turned it over quick ball to Billy Ryan Billy Ryan into Mossy Kion and Mossy Kion buried it so just when you think that you actually have the ball and you're coming out can Kenny have that ability to turn you over when your backs are completely when they think they're running off the shoulder they're in chaos you can turn them over you can actually strike and it's the same when you look at Lenan catching Quaid's puck out there the last day Gerald Hegarty hits him he ends up on the ground Lynch turns him over it's straight into David Reedy into Galan it's buried yeah so it's it's even their weaknesses are their strengths on both sides. Mm. They're that physical. They're that strong. They can turn you over, and it's in those kind of moments of of weakness. I remember hearing that before with the All Blacks as well. That they're the they were the best team in the world to attack to score a try off way off turnover ball. So just when as soon as they obviously you're attacking them they turn you they hit you they turn you over that's the point that's where you're at the weakest Jordan Klopp made that point as well that, yeah. that's the way you press so far up is obviously uh, when you turn them up that far up the field obviously is the better chance of scoring so Limerick have really honed in on that could Kenny have as well maybe I'm doing a disservice to other teams but like if you were to say to me of the last 20 years a team that has the most ferocious intense work rate obviously this Limerick team almost tick every box but I kind of would think quintessential Kilkenny I would think even this year of somehow plucking that Leinster final out of the fire with that work rate in the corner and it's like TJ Reid in amongst it working like a dog and even Adrian Mullen the last day against Clare made one incredible block out in the touchline you know he's just back from injury getting back into the thick of things but the work rate ferocious in his part and he scores a point off the block down is that like a Cody thing who wait, this tradition in Kilkenny of you will be the most ferocious working team out there does I mean I, I'm not exaggerating to say that does David feel like a Kilkenny thing more than most teams I would say yes in that it was and it, and it went down to the fact that it was born out in trainings where you had 40 minute training so obviously a match is 70 minutes long when you cut out all the wides, the freeze, 65s, all that rubbish, it, it's knocked down to 40 minutes. So we would play for 20 minutes with no whistle blown and then half time and then 20 minutes. So there's your there's your 70 minutes with no breathing space whatsoever. He ref the game, obviously, you know, and there's there's references to it of, of the way he would reference, you know, remember Carton House, it's a fairly famous one. Uh, if you asked any of the lads, they'd know the comment of the ball going up between Colin Finley and Jackie and Jackie just absolutely like killed him. Like he, he pulled so far above the ball, it was... It, it, it was criminal what he had done um, and Cody would say you know Jackie don't do it Colin get used to it and that was it and that was his way that he kind of he refed the games by just talking to lads and it, uh, it was fairly ferocious but I don't I, I, I think back in the game like we played Limerick back in 2012 in the we'd lost to Galway and we played them in the quarter final 
And, you know, we talk about the, the physicality of Limerick. Now, Limerick always had physicality. I've never, I've yet to ever see a dressing room like it was in that quarter final at half time and at full time in a Kilkenny dressing room. There was panic at half time. And I still remember that Richie Power was brought off. He was concussed. It was, remember, TJ was dropped. He was told basically where he was at, you know, he yeah. was told to get ready. Um, I, I, Jesus, I remember myself being absolutely torn asunder. I'd hit two puck outs away. Stupidly, Brian was shouting at me so hard. He, he was shouting, Hero. I thought he was saying, Heno. There was no Heno on the team, like, but I thought he was shouting at him. And I was kind of just waiting for this dad to be absolutely torn asunder. And next he looked over at me and was like, Jesus, obviously, it's me he's talking about. But he went around and he dissected everyone. Uh, Richie Hogan got it first and foremost there. He was unfortunately talking when Brian had walked into the dressing room and he was told what to do, basically. Don't say a word, Richie. And it was great. But like after the match, Ty Crowley was going around and the lads were in bits, hands split. Just, just it, it looked like a war zone and, and not to be kind of made, for making it dramatic, but I've never seen so many lads crippled after a game yeah. between, you know, being strapped up, between lads being looked after medically, like, like Ty Crowley was going from one lad and as soon as he finished, he was straight over to another lad, to another lad, to another lad. So Limerick always have had the physicality it's just the fact that now they have that telepathic nature of the way they play, that calmness and composure and that comes with winning 12 finals out of 12. So they... they they, they, they've they just managed to actually add the hurling to that level of physicality which just yeah. possibly was missing at bike stages yeah and uh, James you can pick up the point and we'll note that John Keenan is refereeing the final he turns 50 next year so it's his last ever uh, season and this will be his first senior hurling final now he generally as, I'm, as I understand it, reading different pieces, he has a style which allows things to really flow. And he was praised for his performance in the Munster final last summer because he did let it flow. But I think he was criticised by the referee selection committee for not handing out more cards in the game. So if Keenan decides, well, to hell with this, it's my last game, let's play Hurland, fellas, and pulls a Brian Cody, then uh, who does that suit? <laughs> yeah, permissive might be the word you're looking for there, there Joe. Uh, yeah, and, and I know, uh, you know, there were certain times when I think Claire maybe, you know, felt that short puck outs when they were trying to get the puck out away quickly and Keenan pulled them back last year. There were certain aspects of that that they weren't, they weren't happy with. Listen, I, I think it suits Limerick um, more than Kilkenny. I mean, look, we've, you know, we know how physical Kilkenny are. I mean, it's, it's pretty much look at a standard trade of all Kilkenny teams over the years. But, like this is a bigger, stronger, yeah. uh, I think harder um, Limerick outfit. Um, you know, and you, you just look at the size. I mean, you know, Burns, would I don't know who, Kyle Hayes. I mean, you know, all well over six foot, six mm. five. The two guys in the wings. Um, you know, you throw Morrissey, Hagerty. You know, just just the power they have, Joe, in the middle third, and they ate Galway alive. I mean, Galway just couldn't cope yeah. with the physicality that. Um, you know that Limerick brought, and it's a feature, I suppose, of, of maybe even in the Munster matches over the last couple of years. I mean, Clare were wasted after the the exertions in the Munster final last year. Now I know you got to throw extra time into it, but you know, even um, you know, y- you look at Tip, you know, Tip had nothing in the tank after after playing Limerick this year. Were unbelievably flat against against Watford. And that's been a feature. Watford played Limerick were really flat against Clare. So, you know, there's like they take it out of you. Um, and like the longer that game went on the, in the semi-final, the bigger the, vi- the margin of victory was going to uh, was going was going to be. And you know, you just got the sense that um, there was one time late in the game, Joe, maybe 60, 62 minutes, and Limerick were playing keep ball, you know, their own half of the field, you know, working these triangles, and God, we couldn't get near it. And this is like watching them warm up. You know, they're, they're just so well drilled, so adept. Kinnert just has some. You know, this this is just second nature to them now. You know, this is the way they play. This is the way they train. This is the way they prepare. Mm. And uh, it's, you know, like John, John I'd imagine, will let it go on Sunday. And um, and look, we all want him to let it go. And we all want the game to, to, to flow. But, like, nobody does physicality, uh, I think, better than uh, better than this Limerick side. You know, just given the, the, the sheer physicality, the power they have. And that's not talking about my case here, Dan Morrissey, or the, some of the other guys that they have. So, um if if anything, you know, I, I think it plays into Limerick's, uh, Limerick's hands. Yes, no, that's hard to argue with. They must be the biggest hurling team there's ever been. I know obviously each generation is generally bigger than the last, so they have that in their favour. But I mean, can you think of a better well, I team? One, I remember one point, Joe, um, I don't know, Dave, I, know, I knew what year it was. It was towards the end of my 
time. So it must have been or, or three or four. It was one particular year where it appeared that Cody, you know, had was was going for size. It was probably maybe. I don't know, maybe or three or four because you know obviously you won in in in, um, in two thousand and two whatever um, maybe it was two thousand but it just we, remember we played them in a league game and it just appeared that he'd gone for fellas that maybe you know were just bigger m- maybe you know had the same hurling as as the Tommies or the Jages whatever but uh, uh, you know I, I, it appears as if you know look at the Chaff as Patrick so that kind of player size trumped that trump that but I think you look at here reverted back um you know in, in, in due course but no I, I don't remember a team as physically big as the Slimmick team I mean they are just and they're ripped joke they are mm. physically you know in supreme condition and that's obviously a credit to, to Kinnerk and, and obviously the, the strength and conditioning team yeah David do you accept Limerick edge in those stakes I oh, do, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But you can like when you, when you don't have the actual team sponsor there, and you can see their pecs coming through the yeah. the tops, and you've seen them there for the last two years. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Like when you're kind of looking at them and the physical state that they've got to. I know the teams that uh, James is on about there. Like you're probably looking back to when like Stephen Graham and John Hine and Ken Coogan and Powers was, was there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Brian uh, or Henry Sheffield was obviously there as well. DJ would have been probably one of the smaller ones. Uh, Eddie Brennan, like, but you know, they were. F- I know those two lads are, are they're they're no thin looking lads. If you kind of look at that Galway team, and uh, you know, even a few of the Kilkenny lads still look like they have a bit to go when it comes to filling out the likes of Tom Field and David Blanchfield, um, maybe even Tommy Welsh there too in the in the corner. Mikey Butler is small, but he's he's obviously stocky enough. But there is a, there is a fair bit of development to go. But again, I go back to the fact that a lot of these lads. Have got little or or very little anyway or none to be honest with you. I don't rage growing up in fourteen, sixteen development minor. By the time they get to minor, and I do know by talking to the lads, the first year they actually see weights is pretty much or have been is is minor level with Kenny, and that's that's why they're behind in any of this, right. and that's why it's going to take them a little bit of time when they actually get uh, get that proper structure in place at fourteen and sixteen and. Um, there are people I know there's great work there be done by the likes of Sean Kelly and, and Cole but it just will be a bit of time before there's a proper structure and I suppose that's what Michael Fenley's job is to try and get that going now Yeah I was down pitch level for Limerick Galway and um, even in the parade when they're going by I mean like I'm convinced I'd love if I interview him I'll ask him and, and get him to be honest Garoge Hegarty was breathing very dramatically and like up on his tippy toes and I'm convinced he was just Alpha mailing the Galway team next. I, I'm con- <laughs> like I, now he may say, "Oh no, I was breathing to like stay in the moment." I'm convinced, like he was up on his toes, and these were big breaths and arms out, you know, like a George Bush walk back in the day. I'm just convinced he was like, "You're on my pitch now," kind of vibe pre-game. But that is not that's everything to do with Limerick, and this is not a, a, a disrespect because I said there last day I mean, made a comment of. Uh, the BS or something, the Limerick BS. I didn't mean there's any disrespect to, to again, no disrespect again to <laughs> Limerick. What I mean by that, what I mean by is that if anyone does anything, it's a bit like back in it, with the Kilkenny teams, like Owen Larkin, for instance, would come back into the half back and he'd make a hook and everyone would be like, if you look at Owen Larkin, he's playing as a third man midfielder and he drops deep on whatever. And we're like, no, he just, the ball was back there and he ran back and he got it. But everyone's making up all these mitts. It's like the last year of, of, of straight away, they came out 60 seconds after Galway in the semi final. And like, you know, Brendan Coleman said, Caroline Curls, that's the work that she is doing there. And even when Nikki Quaid goes down, everyone is shitting themselves that, Jesus, what are they doing? They're, they're doing something. Like, yeah. Even if no one does anything, look what they're doing. They're nearly telepathically, they're telling each other. So it's all these things that sometimes can, uh, can happen when you are so dominant, uh, uh, such a dominant team. Anything you do, a bit like Gerald Hegarty being the alpha male, like a big American bald eagle walking around the place, straight away you're like, he is trying to intimidate lads. But I do think if there is one team that just doesn't listen to that or get spooked by these other stories about other teams, it's Kip Kenny. Yeah. They have enough self-confidence and enough victories underneath their belt, whether it has been in senior finals at the start of the noughties or even being in finals or even the Bally Hale contingent who don't lose club all Ireland you know don't mm. they've won three of the last four oh god knows how many all Ireland they have you know they, they don't have to listen to that they have enough confidence in themselves and that's why it does make it intriguing it does yeah but again it is such a fascinating team Mark. you're right about the aura thing like I feel if the big screen shows Paul Knurk walking over and whispering something in John Kiley's ear the opposition bench is like what the hell's going on over there 
you're waiting and straight away everyone is like just wait like I saw a clip there uh, about Gerard Hegarty walks over to the side and on the 20 between the 20th and the 22nd minute every single game that uh, the Gaelic performance process had it up there online and it's like he gets information and he passes it on and straight away then you're thinking Jesus does this happen does he is he the leader yeah. of the team does, he, does some little tiny uh, message go on there every day he comes over a little drink of water and then straight away uh, the things change up and uh, it might happen it might not happen mm. but you're, you'll never find out until lads are tired and they start talking that's interesting like the time Mourinho passed on a message to Lampard and all it said on the paper was win the game but obviously it wasn't about Lampard it was about everybody else Jamesy as a, as a final um, glance back at the semi-final Nicky Quaid has his issues and pauses the game and that's pointed to as like a de- decisive taking the sting out of the, the game did you like did, did Limerick do anything tactically that suddenly flipped that game I haven't heard anyone give like a oh this is what they changed most people seem to think they just you know they absorbed this massive Galway intensity like a boxer and then began to steady themselves and wrestle Galway down physicality and everything else did they do anything tactically that really turned that game for you I, I don't think so Joe I think they just dial up the intensity dial up the physicality um, and Galway you know even at one stage um, you, know, you talk about the, the Limerick puck out uh, you know Parik Manion was, was on was on Tom Morrissey and Morrissey makes a 50 yard 50 metre run into the you know the, the, the centre back centre forward position Manion is wrestling and grappling with him Morrissey shrugs him off sprints to the sideline Nicky Quaid drops the ball five yards from the sideline you know and Morrissey wins it and shuffles it on to somebody else whatever and it's into clan but like the energy that takes you know the, the, the just the, the wear and tear and the hits that Morrissey puts in um, I mean he works incredibly hard and, and I just think Joe I, I can't remember Evan Nyland getting on the ball in general play in the, in the second half and got with smaller players just physically couldn't mm. couldn't seem to cope or survive in the maelstrom that Limerick turned the, the, the middle third into and uh, I, I just think look at it it took them time you know, obviously the four-week break, you know, to get to the pitch, but and they had wides, you know, in the first half, maybe some uncharacteristic wides, but all the guys that missed, you know, whether it was Flanagan or, you know, Morrissey, whatever, you know, Keane Lynch, I think, at a wide. Yeah. They, they all scored again before half time, I think, and, and made their, you know, made the necessary adjustments or corrections. And, uh, no, I, I don't think there was anything you know, tactically differently done. I mean, look at everybody knows where Limerick play. Mm. Everybody knows what they're going to mm. what they're going to do. And yes, it's as if you're powerless to to do anything about it. And I mean, teams have and we've had this conversation before. They've decided, okay, we have to protect our half backs, and we can't have our our half backs on 100 yards from our full backs. And, and the halfback sit and then Morrissey Hagerty and whoever it is run amok yeah. and suddenly have, have six or seven points to play on the board between them and then the halfbacks have got to come out and suddenly you know Galan is getting ball into space and, and you know he, he's wreaking the havoc so it's as if a case of you know pick your poison with them and you know again you know you, you take away the short puck out um, you know push up on them it, it does leave space then for Morrissey and Hagerty or whoever's up there to for Nicky Quay to find those find those little pockets of space and, and, and get them on the ball and if you decide then to, to drop back then they're so good at playing to the lines mm. that they'll carve you up that way or, or get into the rhythm so that's the that's the challenge you're face and face in Kilkenny and obviously Canerk as well as just brilliant at making these small little in-game uh, you know adjustments uh, but Joe like look at you look back at this year right um, certainly in Munster they had their fill you know every game was a yeah. was a real contest I mean Clare obviously beat them in the in, in, in the round robin Clare had the opportunities and should have won that Munster final there's no question about it I mean 20 chances they went to Began 12 wides 5 into the keeper 5 long range freeze missed and, and probably those stats aren't exactly accurate but we had the opportunities we, we just didn't take them and uh, so like they're not they're not unbeatable and Kilkenny certainly you know, won't beat themselves. I mean, Clare arguably lost the game to Kilkenny because, you know, we the self inflicted wound with the with the soft goal we coughed up. You know, Jim O'Ryan gave away a really cheap free on Richie Hogan when he was going nowhere. Rory Hayes pulled on a ball out over the side and late on that he maybe arguably didn't need to TJ cuts it over the bar. Mm. And those are the small margins that you know that, that sometimes make the difference. And Kilkenny just don't, as I said, you know, inflict those wounds on themselves so yes. Limerick will have to will have to win this and um, I think it'll take a, it'll take a big performance and uh, they'll have to be at it now I, I expect them to because you know their process is so good they're just so well drilled so well tuned so well prepared 
and they've got that ability to produce like all the great teams do their best performance on the biggest day and they've done that I mean you look at the way they took Cork apart in, in 21 the performance they delivered um, in 2020 and like 131 last year you know phenomenal stuff in the All-Ireland Finals so but I think it's going to take a similar performance um, at the weekend and you know the, the, the one caveat from a Kilkenny perspective is you know TJ was unbelievable in last year's final uh, you know, I mean, you know, they would have been dead and buried at halftime without without his impact. You know, the just the ball he won, the chance he set up, the freeze he converted. You know, his contribution was every bit as as big as Hagerty's on the on, on the other side. And you know, maybe he didn't sustain it to the same extent in the second in the second half. But I think TJ has arguably lost a step. And you know, I mean, can he keep doing it thirty five or thirty six? You know, playing at the level that he's played at, like it's it's hard to expect him to to be able to do that. And you know, he'll nail the freeze. But mm. I think if if Dan Morrissey curbs his influence, I, I just don't know if the rest of the Kenny attack, you know, will be able to put up the type of score they put up last year. I mean, two twenty six was was incredible. But they were really efficient. Mm. They didn't miss a whole lot. And, and I just don't know if they're firing as well or if they're capable. You know, looking at the Clare match outside of Owen Cody and TJ, you know, John Donnelly. You know, Mossy Keown, Billy Ryan, you know, Tom Fielder, none of them really made any great inroads in the scoreboard. And I think, you know, at least some of the supporting cast is going to have to step up and have a big game and, and, and you know, hit 1-3, one, 1-4 one, from play if they're to get over the line. That's that's the reservation I have. Yeah, it's a very fair point. I know you have to yes. run, you're off to a game. So do you want to give us a prediction? Jamesy Dave is going to stay with us a little longer. It sounds like you're leaning, I mean, almost uh, refer back to my last answer. Therefore, Limerick is your <laughs> prediction. Yeah, but as I said, I was, you know, a week and a half ago, coming out of Croke Park on Saturday night, I, I, I thought, look, at I, I just can't see if Kilkenny, I can't see Kilkenny beating them. The closer it gets, so, as I said, like, the, the, the half forwards, Joe, have definitely, you know, from the Cork game, you know, the last round robin match, it, 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 it seemed to me that they just went deeper. Same thing in the Munster final, we're going to put this on Galan and Flanagan inside, we're going to get them the ball, we're going to be tighter at the back. Uh, and Hugh Lawler, and if it's Mikey Butler, even they decide to, to to leave back, you know, mine in the house. Those guys are as well equipped as anybody to to meet that challenge. Um, and if if that's the way Limerick go, and if if Hugh Lawler does a number on Galan, and he's he's certainly capable of doing that, this might be trickier than, than a tricky proposition for Limerick than, than maybe some people that uh, some people think. But they've got the job done, Joe. They've got the bench. Um, you know they have the, the the know how to close it out when when it's there uh, to be closed out. They've done that all year. They did that in the Munster final, and uh, I just think yeah, four in a row would be so much cheaper, Joe. And it will be given, you know, the I suppose what they've had to overcome, the adversity they faced. You know, losing Sean Finn, arguably possibly losing Hannon. Yeah, it would be somewhat Ireland to win, and I, I just fancy they get it done. Yeah, it really would be. We'll let you go. Thank you so much. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, David. David's going to stay with us a moment. Uh, we'll take a very short break. David Herity uh, going to stay on for some final thoughts. Back in one sec. Hurling on off the ball with Board Gosh Energy. Hurling, it's anyone's game. Hurling on off the ball with Board Gosh Energy. Hurling, it's anyone's game. Now you're welcome back. We're looking ahead to the All Ireland hurling final. James O'Connor was with us, as was David Herity, who still is here with us. Just on the points, James, he was making there before the break. David, pretty interesting. He made a slightly worrying case for Kilkenny if TJ maybe has lost a yard or doesn't contribute as much as last year. Is they, are they fair points? Yeah, the, the first thing when you were kind of asked the question, did anything change after the Nicky Quaid uh, yeah. thing? Anyway, and again, I, I think a lot was. I think too much was made out of that. I think if if my Casey doesn't make that save on the line, God, we were eight points up in the thirty first minute. So I, I just I just think a, a lot of people are nearly looking nearly to find a reason to dislike Limerick and what they're doing. But every like I said before, everyone is doing it, um, and I think it was just built up a little bit too much. But God, uh, Limerick did drop a line. Uh, five out of the next ten puckouts, they got scores off. Um, so they, they, everyone just dropped back. At one point, there there was. I think the camera just cut off a cornerback. There were six lads nearly across the, the full back line. So basically, they started off then, and that's where they, they got lads into the game, got them in possession, worked the ball out, and were able to get the ball out to midfield. I think it was David Reedy who was fouled in straight away. And sorry, so sorry, small little yeah, things there. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, because that's really interesting. <clears throat> and you're, you're watching this with a coach's eye, as we know. Is that move, because as you said there, it's a small move. Is that like How impressive is that that they 
diagnose the problem and they choose that solution to it in game would you sort of feel well any coach worth his or her salt should be able to see that and make that move or is that kind of uber impressive that that small tweak makes such a big difference and that's kind of the genius of Canerc it's it's kind of twofold there straight away I'd say every every team has two or three different tactics where they're going to, whether they're going to play three inside two inside one inside whether they're going to have a, a row, four, four man midfield or sorry four man half forward whether they're going to have a third man midfield or whether they're going to drop in a sweeper whether they're going to have a sweeper just designated to one side people have their kind of certain two or three different formations that they're going to go with the it's about finding the right time as to when we're actually when we're in danger here. Like Limerick were four points down, they didn't do anything different. They were five points down, didn't do anything different. They kind of waited, you know, they were they waited to a point in the game where they could kind of feel, yeah, this is actually slipping from us. It's now we see what they're doing. They actually take the time to actually assess where they're at, where the opposition are at, and now is a good time to make that switch. Where some teams might make that switch after 10 minutes and they might panic and drop someone out, they generally tend to assess around that kind of water break time that this is a good time to observe where we're at and now let's let's make that move. The impressive thing about them is the fact that they obviously, everyone together knows, lads, this is what's happening. They must have a call and, and that's what happens. And generally you would have a call from the sideline, whether it is just say 13 on or 13 off, just say that would have been one of the calls that we would have had before with, uh, with one of our teams. I meant the 13 kind of comes out to midfield and he's a third man midfield. Um, the impressive thing is yeah, they all move in sync and move back. But again, that comes from the fact that they have, a, apart from Sean Finn, is every single one of those players, uh, have they all been involved, involved in that 2018 final? Like Every single one of them have yeah. been trained by Kylie and Kinnark all the way up for the for the next 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. You can't beat that. And I know they're going for four in a row and everyone's talking about that. They're going for, isn't it, five out of six yeah. years. Like this, this team is, and it's the same bloody players. Like it's it, it doesn't change. So when you have the same management team, and sometimes people are looking for freshness and stuff like that now, I definitely get it. Uh, but it's, it's, when you have the same management team, obviously, Putting it, adding in your extra couple of players every so often, maybe it's Mo Cahy, maybe it's Reedy, maybe it's Carl O'Neill that they did this year in Championship. But it's the same principles. This is how we play. Come back, lads. We're clearly not winning our puckouts. They weren't winning any of their puck or very few of their puckouts in the first in that first twenty minutes. Obviously, they just drop back a line. When they drop back a line, that obviously drags Galway a little bit further out the field. And then when you're winning it there and you have that physicality to be able to break the tackle, pop it off, well, then that's left that gap in behind. Mm -hmm. And then you're popping the ball overhead to Flanagan, you're popping the head ball over to, to Casey or to Gillan then. And, uh, okay, th th that was a really interesting tangent then. So, James's point, his worries about Kilkenny scoring enough against Limerick, not least if TJ can't replicate what he did in last year's final. Yeah, and again, I think, I know TJ might be wearing number 14. I expect him to, to play centre forward. If the Willow Donahue's job is to go back and protect, a bit like Declan Hannan last year, that's what Park Welsh and John Donnelly picked off three points off Declan Hannan last year, and they were completely on their own. I expect TJ to be out there, and no better man to be an outlet there to be able to receive that ball and stick it over the bar if if that happens. But that middle eight, again, Going back at the la on the last three games, the middle eight for Kilkenny have scored 119. The middle eight for Limerick have scored 30 points. And right. That's the killer there. Right. But they can actually just, they can, and out of that 119, 115 has come from probably the, the you wouldn't expect it, or, or Tom Phelan. Just he got one four out against Wexford. So again, they are, that, that shooting power, that firing power is just not really there. There's too many of them firing blanks in that area. Whereas if you look at, uh, if you look at that, that that Limerick team there again, just say that David Reedy has got four points, uh, Tom Marcy have down for seven points, Gerald Hegarty six points there. They're just all clocking in with nice bit of points. There, um, four points. Kyle Hayes four points from half back. You just don't get that with you're or you're not getting that with the Kilkenny team. Yeah. And I understand people might say Adrian Mullen wasn't playing in the Leinster final, but you know uh, Keane Lynch wasn't playing either in the Munster final. So it, it balances itself out. That's the area that's 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 a bit of a killer for Kilkenny. The, the areas they have to outplay them is the, and the positive for Kilkenny is the fact they scored ten goals in those three games, whereas Limerick have only scored four. They're still not that goal hungry. But again, that's what people say. They they go with the advantage. If the advantage mm -hmm. or the percentage advantage is scoring a point, do 
took it over the bar. They did that, wasn't it? 2020, they won not Ireland without scoring a goal. Like mm-hmm. they, they have yeah. that ability to keep popping it over and popping it over and popping it over and killing you with a thousand cuts out the field. So that's kind of impressive. The, the, the other thing is obviously, I, I think that Kenny just simply have to be in this game with 20 minutes to go when they unleash this kind of bench of Killian Buckley Park, Welsh, Wally Welsh, Key, whether it's Richie Hogan, Keen Kenny, maybe Billy Drennan in the last few minutes, depending on if Blanchard's not starting. Mm. Do Kenny have to be in the game? They have to make sure that they are in at that fighting chance. And I do think they have a great chance, Kenny, but only if they manage to stay alive, that starting team. I think that Limerick starting team and the Kenny starting team, there's no there's no real comparison in my view. I think Limerick are by far stronger. But if that Kenny team can just keep them alive until they empty the bench, I think that gives Kenny a great chance mm. down the straight. Yeah, that's a really intriguing way of setting it up. By the way, do you have all those numbers that you just read out there over the last three minutes written down? I feel like I'm talking to John Nash in a beautiful mind here. Well, no, you, well, yeah, you'd write, once you write it down, then it sticks in your head. Oh, so man. sometimes yeah. it's impressive. Um, I'm very curious to ask you about the two goalkeepers here. You mentioned Quaid's puckouts, for instance. Uh, so I'd just be your, your, your thoughts on him generally as a keeper. And you might start then with Owen Murphy because obviously. You know his save in the semi-final. It, like it's kind of an iconic save. I'd say you know as, as, as a keeper you'd appreciate you know in your highlights reel the day on Murphy retires it'll be the first save they show on the six-one. It's that kind of a magical moment. You'd have, have an appreciation for how good that is because like I was, I, was, I was at the game. I couldn't even see the ball. Do you know what I mean? I saw mm. someone swing and then I saw him dive and God knows what happened. So I don't know how he did it. He did it because that's all. Like that's all. I spoke about it there after the semi-final. That's that's just not a surprise. Um, and I sent him a message afterwards. I said the country's going to be surprised at what you've done, but I don't think. But nobody that trains with him is like. I said it is. It is absolutely amazing. But that lad does that in training just religiously. It's it's a sickening thing when you're in goal or you're a sub goalie and you're watching him up the far end put him. But that's what he could do, and uh, he was. It, it, it's just one of the, it, there's, there's something you know I, I kind of said it there during the week um, to someone it's a bit like the Quaid and uh, Quaid and uh, Owen I think it's a bit like the Ronaldo and Messi debate really like if you give Owen a, a compliment like Limerick is our open arms straight away and the abuse starts flying and again if someone starts if Quaid gets an off there straight away it's the, the Owen Murphy uh, brigade are on and it's I, I would simply say it, it's very like the Jared Piquet uh, quote when he said that uh, was it Ronaldo is the best of all the humans but Messi's from a different pan- planet yeah. and that's how I would see view these two goalies Quaid is is an incredible incredible goalkeeper and the more I kind of look back in the three games and obviously when you're caught up with a team all year you don't really appreciate it. when you look back at what he's doing from general open play as well it's it's unbelievable even like even the 111 I said came directly from his pockets in the Munster final and again you know when they, they do the re, the the clips and they're showing um they're showing the replays of Aaron Glant's goal and they're showing everyone spoke about David Reedy's inch perfect pass Beautiful ball straight in front of Galan. Galan gets it and buries it. Everyone does. Nobody talks about the 100-yard pass that Quaid stuck mm. right on the outside of David Reedy to give him that opportunity to bounce it into his hand for him to turn around and then pick out Galan. But he's just phenomenal. But then you have to own down the far end. I know he came in for a bit. He lost out in the All-Star last year because uh, I think it was Quaid, Quaid had something like six balls and he kept on to six balls. His, his strike and his retention rate was, was 100%. Owen had nine balls. And he gave away four of them. And it was kind of in that that people were trying to say that pretty much right. that's the difference between the two keepers. Now, if you look at Owen there this year, his retention rate has has improved greatly. It was seven out of eight in the in the semi-final. So he, he is trying to be a lot more cautious with his, instead of driving the ball along, he did it four times against Galway and lost all four. He, is, he did it once against Clare and lost it. I think he is just trying to build on it and trying to make sure that just keep on to the ball, keep on to the ball. Yes. Did a brilliant thing in the, in the Leinster final, gave a ball out to TJ, TJ ran, stuck it over a bar from 100 yards. So it's, uh, yeah, he, he's improving on that aspect of his team. But there's nothing I would say with Owen. There's absolutely zero he's not able to do if he's coached properly. Okay. So if you tell him, right, oh, we're going short, we're going mid, it's not like he doesn't have it in his arsenal. Yeah, he's able okay. to do these things. So, well, taking that point, that said, if you were, am I, am I right then, in it, following your answer, 
if you were to build a prototype perfect goalkeeper, are you taking Quaid's distribution and Murphy's shot stopping and then you've got kind of perfection? Is that what you're telling me in a way? Yeah, and Owen's handling, like him being able to, his his agility and re, his agility yeah, reflexes, his first touch on the ground. He is an outfielder and, and I still wish they just put him outfield. It would have been great if they had to put him outfield when they did give him a chance. We could have got a couple of extra years, but he, he's <laughs> he's brilliant. He's basically an outfielder in goal, but he's that fantastic. But Quaid's distribution, absolutely. The way that he, he's able to man and control his square, control what's going on there and yeah own handling touch uh, reflexes yeah absolutely that's the, that's the perfect keeper and again they, they've, they've knocked up I suppose five all-stars yeah. out of the last seven and it'll be six out of eight now so they are the two best in the land at the moment okay so prediction time your your points about the middle third and scoring were really interesting um, and I guess you said if Kilkenny's first 15 can stay in the game you quite like what's coming off the bench to try and see it out how do you think it's going to play out on Sunday? I, I, it's it's Limerick's to lose, really, is the thing. It's that they've look at they've won twelve finals in a row. They know what they're doing. If I'm back in Kilkenny, it's it's simply because that's where I was born. To be honest with you, and it's the fact that you just believe that they're able to pull it out of the bag. I I, I agree with what Derek Ling had said. They're, not much has changed since last year and the players will say there's not much has, playing, has changed since last year but Derek said there in an interview there during the week they just are playing better and they're they're just the likes of Owen Cody is playing better these lads have now lost the final they lost the league final but they're learning Adrian Mullen is going to get better and better like all the players seem to have just improved since last year but it's just the fact is it enough to actually beat a Limerick team on the day uh, I I Again, like I said, they have to. In 2019, they were up by 11 points and one point in that in their opening half, and that's what got them in front. That's what got them that victory. The only loss that, that Limerick have obviously had in the last five years. They need to get off to an absolutely incredible start. They need to get off to the same kind of start that Galway did in the semi final, and then try and hope that then, yeah, they release the cavalry at half to uh, whatever around the 40, 50th minute, and then kick on from there. But it's. Uh, it's going to be a serious task. If, if it's a Kilkenny victory, Christ, it's going to be one of the best ones of all time. Yeah. I always feel in some ways, it's a strange thing to say given what he won, but in, in some respects, Cody's finest hour was beating Limerick in that semi-final a couple of years ago with the team he beat them with. Yeah. There's a lot of still players still have, still around from that time. Again, Limerick yeah. have, I think Limerick have the 15 again that, that came on that day that started and came on. Kilkenny still have 12. There was a lot more than the started than I actually thought. And again, you know, Hugh Lawler has had, a, you know, if you look at Galan as dra- dragged, I suppose it's, it's probably a bit, uh, bit much there to, to drag Limerick through the Lim- uh, through that Munster campaign. Hugh Lawler's kept him to two points the last two times he's played him in championships. So there is that bit of hope there. Yeah. That he, he does have a number on him, even though I know Galan, his knee that came out after his last year, his knee wasn't the best. But it's a... Uh, Look, it, it is it is a struggle to look past, and the team is as good as that that Limerick team. It is a struggle to look past them, but I do think if any team can beat them and match them physically and have the belief, it is the Kilkenny team. Yeah, try and end the Brian Cody famine once and for all. <laughs> I, I'm twisting your words here. don't worry um, just before you go by the way it's it's funny I, we had talked a couple of weeks ago just about the demands of inter-county coaching and you were you know jokingly saying I'm playing hide and seek with my kids and I'm making sure I'm hiding a long time because I need to be thinking about hurling so I suppose I, I got a sense that night that you were seriously thinking about the commitment levels and then I saw the news you'd uh, stepped away from Kildare and I mean judging even by I just opened a Leinster leader uh, piece here you're going to be sorely missed because it talks about your five years full of success, silverware, promotion and of course disappointment as well. Kildare Hurling has ended, um, that five years rather, has ended with the announcement that manager David Herodes decided to move on. The former Kilkenny All-Ireland winning goalkeeper has brought Kildare Hurling to a new level, a level they had not seen prior to his arrival and they mentioned the two Christy Ring Cup successes as well which had other counties sitting up and taking notice. So... You know, I'm, I'm sure you're sad to leave and it wasn't all perfect, but very few managers get to leave with glowing endorsements like that. It usually ends in a failure and you're kicked out of the county. So that's obviously a really good uh, first innings to your, your inter-county coaching career. Yeah, look, I, 
Uh, I know you have some su- success, and I, I, I had a very tough fight in first year with uh, with Kildare. We didn't get out of the group stage in the Christie Ring. We lost to Ross Common by a point, and the previous year Kildare had beaten Ross Common by twenty six points. So that there was a lot of soul searching. I had a brilliant mentor, uh, Colin Nolan, who I had to ring after that game, and and. I suppose the, the biggest learning for me was the fact that I was trying to do everything. I had come from Dublin Camogie as well and I had a wonderful backroom team um, with me. But I was I came into the kind of the, the, the step up and straight away I was still trying to do the analysis. I was still trying to, I suppose, wash the bibs. I was still trying to do some of the coaching and then the management team. But Kildare provided me that opportunity and I'm very grateful for of actually building and constantly building and adding to the team and spending five years there and trying to improve year on. Like By the time we finished out a backroom team of 18, I started off with six. Um, it, it, I was very lucky. The, the big thing for me, and it's not, I know the silverware is grand and, and it's lovely to have, I suppose, kind of four medals or lads to have medals when they're finishing off. But the big thing for me would be the retention rate of the players when that team was announced in December. Um, when I kind of arrived, there was a panel of 32 that had just won a Christie ring. And by the time we started the league, 16 lads remained off that. Right. So in, the, in that space of nine months, um, 17 lads had left the panel. And it's the big, it's the it's the one thing I just want from, from the Kildare side of things. And I hope that uh, trying to kill that culture of, of, you just come in, you do your time and you go. I used to always kind of say, it was very similar to kind of Kilkenny football. I'm not comparing teams likewise, but I, I always kind of compared Kilkenny football to like uh, the army where you go off and you do your six months and then you, and that's you done. Like uh, That kind of developing, when counties are in developing mode, they have to get away from that. Players have to come in and they have to commit before they're going to see results. Mm. And if I can actually try and, inst- or not myself, but even the management team, if we can try and, and have instilled enough kind of passion within the lads that this means so much and ye mean so much to Kildare Hurling to stay on and drive this on. If those lads out of the 35 plus the three injured lads, 38 lads that are in that WhatsApp group and they left, if we can manage to keep on 30 plus of those, yeah. or Kildare can, that'll be an outstanding achievement. So it'll only be December before I realise whether I actually did any kind of a decent job or not. Well, I dare say you did a great job. Like the County Board Chairman, Mick Gorman, said the move was Herodes and Herodes alone. And as far as we're concerned, we would have had no issue whatsoever if David had decided to stay on for another year or two. An absolute gentleman, he owes Kildare Hurling nothing. Kildare Hurling's in a far better place than before he came and I wish him the very best so again after five years that's a ringing endorsement we kind of on the show understandably neglect you know life as a as an up and coming hurling county I, maybe sometime in the next couple of weeks I might chat to you about the challenges and the realities and, and, and what it's like as a, as a Kildare hurling person versus Kilkenny hurling person but um, we are out of time this evening I'm afraid but uh, thank you for the time appreciate it Good man, thanks very much, Joe. Thanks a million. David Herity there on the line, uh, previewing the hurling final. We will do that piece with David in a couple of weeks' time, maybe when things quieten down and hear about life in Kildare versus the um, more traditional counties. The hurling coverage, as ever, on Off the Ball, with thanks to Board Gosh Energy, and Off the Ball has teamed up with Board Gosh Energy to uncover stories highlighting the positive impact hurling has had on people's lives. Full competition details go to boardgoshenergy.ie forward slash BGEGAA, and you can register. So, uh, plenty more build up to the game, obviously, over the next couple of days. Hurling on Off the Ball with Board Gosh Energy. Hurling, it's anyone's game.